Our last, this is the last uh, lecture. I know it says video games and your kids, how parents stay in control. Um, that's not completely what this chapter, what this week I'm going to be talking about. Um, kind of got into it, uh, couldn't find the right stuff. Uh, so I decided to um, change it a little bit. And you'll see what's going on when, when we get into it. So, yeah, um, if there's something that I, that I haven't touched on that, uh, that you'd like me to, uh, to talk about um, for the next class, actually, because this is the last lecture for this class, uh, please just drop me an email and, and say, hey, I, I was hoping you would talk about, you know, whatever, and you didn't. Um, uh, most of this, uh, you know, I've got a whole stack of uh, textbooks here. Um, I'm looking at about seven or eight. Um, so I, I've got a lot of resources, but the problem is that that nothing is cohesive. Um, and, and that's why I've had to kind of piece things together. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and get started on, uh, on, on this lecture. Um, I hope it's... I hope it goes together well. I, it took me a couple days to to really get into this and find the information that I was really looking for. Uh, the gaming industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, and for that reason, uh, they they have been able to uh, temper uh, people's anger about uh, about uh, addiction um, and uh, the the fact that. Uh, they're creating environments where where people uh, are are getting hurt. <clears throat> uh, the addiction part is really kind of interesting. This is a really serious problem in Asia, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, China. Um, this is also a problem in Germany, uh, an an admitted problem in Germany. It's probably only the United States that's really having. Uh, uh, pushback uh, on whether this is really a problem or not. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started. He said, there we go. Okay. Uh, last lecture. Uh, addiction is any pleasurable behavior that renders a person unable to stop once started and which is pursued in spite of negative consequences. Over time, the individual develops a tolerance to a given level of addictive activity or substance they stop feeling satisfied at, uh, at a certain level of use and require more activity or substance uh, to get the original euphoria. When unable to engage in the addiction, the person enters withdrawal. Gaming addiction is often said to be present when an individual has completely lost control over their game, uh, game playing and their excessive playing behavior has had a detrimental effect on all aspects of their life and comp compromises their job and or their educational activities, interpersonal relationships, their hobbies, general health, and psychological well-being. These two criteria, impaired control and harmful consequences, are regarded as fundamentally important criteria for addiction. An alternative model of addictive behavior has proposed six features of components of gaming addiction. To indicate addiction, it is thought that these criteria must be sustained uh, for a period of between three to six months. Salience. Uh, this occurs when gaming becomes the most important activity in a person's life, dominating their thoughts, preoccupation and cognitive distortions, emotions, cravings, and behavior, deterioration of normal behaviors. An addicted gamer is obsessed with all aspects of video games, and when not playing, will be anticipating or planning the next playing state uh, session. Mood modification. This refers to the changes in a person's mood state that occur as a result of gaming. Mood change uh, may involve a subjective feeling of euphoria as well as an increase in physiological arousal, increased heart rate, muscle tension, or shaky hands, or alternatively, a tranquilizing feeling of calm or numbing sensation. And I think that's what this guy is, he's uh, numbed out, as it were. Uh, he doesn't look very engaged, does he? 
Tolerance, uh, this refers to the process whereby the increasing amounts of gaming are required to achieve the former mood-modifying effects. This means that players gradually increase the amount of time they spend engaged in gaming. It could be argued that addicted gamers build up their tolerance to the point that they will end a playing session only when they have become mentally or physically exhausted. Now we're going to talk about uh, I'll talk about tolerance in a minute. Um, it's, it's really kind of interesting because I found a website that talked about people that had died playing video games. Uh, so uh, and we're going to actually be talking about that in just a second. But they're all uh, these are the aversive mood states and or the physical effects that occur when gaming is suddenly discontinued or reduced. Uh, psychological withdrawal symptoms include feelings of frustration, irritability, and flattened effect. Uh, withdrawal motiv uh, motivates the individual to play video games on a regular basis and to minimize periods of uh, absence from a video game in order to alleviate these unpleasant feelings, uh, feeling states. Relapse. This refers to the tendency for the player to make repeated reversions to earlier patterns of gaming and for even the most extreme patterns typical of the height of uh, excessive gaming to be quickly restored after periods of abstinence or moderation. Relapse usually indicates that the individual has lost personal agency over their behavior. Conflict or harm. This refers to the negative consequences of excessive gaming. Harm includes conflicts between the addicted video game player and other people, family members and friends, other activities, jobs, school, social life, hobbies, and interests, and from within the, ad the addict themselves, psychological distress. Large sample studies generally report prevalence values below 10%. <clears throat> now, personally, I'm thinking that 10% is still pretty high. I think that 10% is still pretty high. Uh, a study conducted in the United States on a national, national representative sample of teenagers, as well as a large sample of Singaporean children, both reported a problematic game use of approximately 9%. Now, if you, if you take uh, any select 10 kids, uh, maybe uh, the high school in Chin Lee, um, and you, you, you uh, line these kids up and you go, every 10th kid has a problem. You know, that's still a lot of kids with, with a lot of uh, gaming problems. And potentially, uh, that may be true. There may be a lot of kids uh, going to high school on the, on the uh, Navajo Nation uh, who have gaming problems or play way a little bit too much. Results of another representative study in Germany showed that 3% of the male and 0.3% and of the female students were diagnosed as dependent on video games. <clears throat> while another 4.7% of male and 0.5% of uh, female students were at risk of becoming dependent. In a large Hungarian online gamer sample, 3.4% of the gamers belonged to the high-risk group of problematic gaming, and another 15.2% of the medium-risk group. A proportion of 4.6% of, of Hungarian uh, adolescents, approximately 16 years old, <clears throat> belonging to a national sam sample were classified as high-risk users. According to an online survey examining all types of online gamers, uh, and they were looking at uh, 4,374, the mean age was 21 years and participants were mostly male, 91%, and single, 66%. Their average weekly game time varied between less than seven hours, about 10% of, of that population, and more than 42 hours, also 10% of that population, with most of the gamers playing 15 to 27 hours weekly. That was, that was uh, 35%. 16% of all gamers were playing professionally, i.e. they participate in competitions and earn, earn money if they win. The majority of this sample, 79%, had a clear gaming preference, namely they played one single game type most of the time. Let me take a quick drink. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Data regarding the, the three main game types give a, a more nu nuanced view. 
Uh, the proportion of female gamers is the lowest in the case of massively multiplayer uh, online first-person shooter, MMOFPS games, 1-2%, to 2 and the highest is massively multiplayer online role-playing game, uh, MMORPG users, 15-30%. to 30%. These are females. MMOFPS uh, users are the youngest, 18 to 19.8 years, while both massively uh, multiplayer online real-time strategy, uh, MMORTS, 22 years, and MMORPG players, 21 to 27 years, are significantly older. So some of the games uh, young kids want to play and some of the games older kids uh, or, or, or adults are, are, are playing. Among the three main groups, uh, role-playing gamers uh, spend the most time playing. Now, you, you think, oh, oh, wait a minute, why, why in the wor world do you have this lady over here? The reality is this is not, um, this is very, uh, a very common um, uh, picture of, of uh, what, you're, what they are seeing on their video games. This is an Amazonian from some, one of the games. AmazonWarriors.com, www.AmazonWarriors.com. Um, this was one of the less risque pictures that, that I saw in this uh, uh, role-playing game, <clears throat> Amazon Warriors. Uh, since uh, role-playing uh, role uh, are the most researched games, most likely because they allow players to interact, to form friendships, create communities, and work together, to accomplish a variety of goals, there is additional information regarding such players that is still uncommon in the case of other game types. Half of uh, role player players are uh, full time, 22.2% uh, are students. Uh, they work full time, I'm sorry. Uh, role player, what is it, 22% are students. Half are uh, full time employees, 14.8% are homemakers. 18.9% of whom were female. 36% of the uh, gamers are married, and 22% of them have children. Overall, the demographic composition of role-player users is quite varied and probably more diverse than the composition of strategy uh, players and shooter players, uh, although this needs to be empirically established. And, of course, we're not exactly sure how true that is. There is now a relatively large number of studies, all indicating that excessive uh, video game play can lead to a variety, a wide variety of negative psychosocial consequences for a minority of effective individuals. These include sacrificing work, education, hobbies, socializing, time with partner, family, and sleep, uh, increased stress and absence of real life relationships, lower psychosocial well being and loneliness poorer social skills, decreased academic achievement, increased inattention, aggressive oppositional behavior and hostility, maladaptive coping, decreases, decreases in verbal memory performance, maladaptive cognitions, and suicidal ideations. In addition to the reported negative psychosocial consequences, there are also many reported health and medical consequences that may result from excessive video game playing. These include epileptic seizures because of the flashing lights, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, enuresis, uh, wetting the bed, uh, incaprices, uh, that is uh, defecating in your bed, uh, or defecating in your pants, I guess, uh, obesity, wrist pain, neck pain, elbow pain, uh, tenosynovitis, uh, also known as nintenditis, uh, blisters, calluses, sore tendons, and numbness of fingers, hand-arm vibration syndrome, uh, sleep abnormalities, psychosomatic challenges, and repetitive strain injuries. Uh, taken together, this relatively long list of potential psychosocial and medical negative consequences clearly indicates that excessive gaming is an issue irrespective of whether it is an addiction. It also suggests that more extensive uh, recognition is needed of the wide range of potential negative and life-limiting uh, consequences of excessive video play. Let me relate a real quick story 
there was uh, somebody on the on the Navajo Nation uh, who I befriended, or she became a friend of mine. Uh, it turned out that she had two sons. One of her sons was um, both of her sons were ga gamers. Uh, one of her sons wouldn't do anything else. Um, he wouldn't uh, cut wood. Uh, he wouldn't haul water. Uh, he wouldn't do anything. And the mother, of course, had to do that. <clears throat> he uh, gamed so much and so constantly uh, that he lost his ability to walk. Um, he became sedent totally sedentary. Eventually, he this kid is, uh, I call him a kid, uh, he was in his early 30s. Uh, he died. Uh, he died of a blood clot. Um, lots of reasons as to why this may have happened. Um, you know, there may have been genetic problems. Um, anyway, uh, she, she didn't force him to do anything, and he chose not to do anything and to play games all the time. And eventually, of course, it, uh, it killed him. Uh, in his early 30s, which is way too young to be, well, anytime, well, not really. <laughs> I would say anytime's too young to die, but the, the reality is that uh, uh, we all have expiration dates. I'm thinking uh, the gaming had something to do with uh, uh, decreasing the number, his, his expiration date. Um, I can remember sometimes she would come up and ask me for money. Um, she would want, try to, she'd be trying to sell me something and I would, you know, she'd say, I just need $5 to get my son a hamburger, um, because that's what he wanted. And, you know, she, well, anyway, uh, so she fed him, um, but he was relatively sedentary. It's really kind of a tragic story if you think about it. A number of studies have examined the role of different personality factors, comorbidity factors, and the biological factors, and their association with gaming addiction. In relation to personality traits, gaming addiction has uh, been shown to have associations with neuroticism, aggression, and hostility, avoidant and schizoid interpersonal tendencies, loneliness and introversion, social inhibition, boredom, inclination, uh, sens uh, sensation seeking, diminished agreeableness, diminished self-control, and narcissistic personality traits, low self-esteem, uh, uh, state and trait anxiety, and low emotional intelligence. And the reason I told you that story is because I don't want you to think, oh, this is just something that, that other people have. This isn't something that, it, it, this isn't a problem that we would have on the, on the Navajo Nation. That's not true at all. That's, uh, there are, there are people that are, are excessive gamers on the reservation as well. Research has also shown gaming addiction to be associated with a variety of comorbid disorders. This includes attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, depression, social phobia, school phobia, and various psychosomatic symptoms. Through use of functional MRI, uh, biological research has shown that gaming addicts uh, show similar neural pro processes and increased activity in brain areas associated with substance-related addictions and, and other behavioral addictions, such as pathological gambling, uh, significant activation in the left occipital lobe, the parahippocampal gyrus, the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, the right orbital frontal cortex, the bilateral anterior cingulate, the medial frontal cortex, and the caudate nucleus. And actually, at the end of this lecture, uh, I will be talking about a certain piece of research uh, where they were looking at um, uh, treating uh, individuals suffering from excessive uh, game use usage, and they, they mention all, well, not all of these areas, but they were doing a functional MRI to determine whether they uh, could treat, uh, could reduce the amount of uh, activity in these areas, in these areas of the brain uh, with medication. It's really kind of fascinating. Prior to the publication of the latest DSM-5, there had been some debate as to whether internet addiction should be introduced introduced into the text as a separate disorder. Alongside this, there was debate as to whether those researching uh, in the online addiction field should be researching generalized internet use, 
and or the potential addictive activities that can be engaged in on the internet. For example, gambling, video game, uh, video gaming, sex, shopping, etc. Following these debates, the Substance Use Disorder Work Group, the SUDWEG, uh, recommended that DSM-5 include a subtype of problematic internet use, uh, for example, internet gaming disorder in Section 3. Emerging measures and models uh, as an area that added future research before being included in future editions of the DSM. Okay, so it looks like we may have something in the future, internet gaming disorder. <clears throat> According to Petrie and O'Brien, uh, internet gaming disorder will uh, not be included as a separate mental disorder until the defining features of, of uh, IGD uh, have uh, been identified. Uh, reliability and validity of specific internet gaming disorder uh, criteria have been obtained cross-culturally. Prevalence rates have been determined in representative epidemiological samples across the world and etiology and associated biological features have been evaluated. Now remember I told you that the uh, gaming industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and there are people, uh, there are um, companies, uh, Nintendo, uh, PlayStation, uh, who else is there? PlayStation. Um, well, I can't think of anybody. You know, Blizzard. You know, all of these, all, all of these companies are making millions and millions of dollars off of these kids constantly playing their games. Now, the problem is, of course, that they have power and they can influence researchers by hiring them, giving them whatever you know, giving them research money uh, to find out that that uh, you know none of this is true, and that's one of the reasons why. There are four criteria here, and it looks like IGD is never going to become a uh, 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 recognized disorder. Okay. <clears throat> One of the key reasons that uh, Internet uh, Gaming Disorder was not included in the main text of the DSM-5 was that the working group concluded that no standard diagnostic criteria were used to assess gaming addiction across these many studies. And of course, one of the things that uh, they discovered was study after study after study said that this, it, this is a potential problem. This is a problem. Uh, we have high risk factors and we have people that are addicted. We need this to be in the DSM-5. But the uh, uh, DSM-5 rejected it. And the reason is because the studies weren't, weren't standardized. They weren't looking at the same thing. Uh, if you remember from an earlier debate uh, in, in an earlier text, uh, they were saying that, well, we can't uh, violent video games, VVD, VVGs. Uh, we can't uh, uh, define what violent is, uh, as bizarre a, a thought as that is. But that, that's the kind of argu silly arguments that they're having uh, so that they don't make IGD a problem. Because if they do, then they're going to have to, there may be a regu uh, people regulating um, the, uh, the, the video games. Now, they've already done it to some extent. They've, you know, they've made it uh, PG-13 or the, the uh, teenage, uh, they have the, uh, the, the teen games and the preteen games uh, and the adult games. So th these are for adults only. Uh, but the reality is, of course, this kid can play any game he wants as long as he, he he doesn't have to buy it. Somebody else can buy it for him, or somebody else can buy it and he can use it. A, a review of instruments assessing problematic pathological and or addictive gaming by King and colleagues reported that 18 different screening instruments had been developed and that these had been used in 63 quantitative studies uh, comprising 58,415 participants. Now, the studies are out there. The problem is that they're using 18 different screening instruments. And because of that, and because it's not standardized, then the, uh, the gaming industry is saying, hey, look, you guys are looking at so many different things. Uh, you know this this isn't any good uh, you know you're 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 drawing you're uh, you're looking for straws you're just drawing straws this is silly
there's no problem with with video games. The vast majority of people don't have a problem. Well, that may be tr true. What did we see back here? Uh, what was it? Right here. 10% of, of the people in the United States. That's not so many. Singapore. Oh, it's 9%. I'm sorry. 9%. 3% and 3% of males and 0.3% of females. Come on. Hungary, 3.4%. You know, 4.6% of of the adolescents belong to a national center classified as high risk 4.6 percent what is that one out of every 20 people are going to have a problem yeah but that's still one out of every 20 people in the united states the problem that we have is that some of these people turn into uh shooters and now we've got we've got a pile of dead people and that's not a really good idea anyway so let's go ahead and get into what i was talking about the King et al. Uh, review identified both strengths and weaknesses of these screening instruments. The main strengths of the instrumentation included, one, the brevity and ease of scoring. That's always important. Excellent psychometric uh, properties such as con uh, convergent validity and internal consist consistency. And number three, robust data that will aid uh, the development of standardized norms for adolescent populations. Okay. So they, they said all these three popular uh, positive things. So let's look at the weaknesses uh, of the instrumentation. Core addiction indicators being inconsistent across studies. They can't, they can't agree on what addiction indicators are. Uh, general lack of any temporal dimension. How long did they, did they uh, do the, uh, the test? Did they do it for six weeks? Did they, do, did they do it for a month? Did they do it for six months? Did they do it for a year? This is the problem that they're talking about, which is kind of an interesting argument. Inconsistent cutoff scores relating to clinical status. Poor, poor and or inadequate inter-rater reliability and predictive validity and untested or inconsistent dimensionality. In other words, the, some of the, they had 18 different instruments that they were looking at. A recent uh, review by Curley, Kerali and uh, colleagues uh, argued that some researchers uh, consider video games as the starting point for examining the characteristics of this specific disorder, while others consider the internet as the main platform that unites different addictive internet activities, including online games. Recent studies have made an effort to integrate both approaches. Consequently, uh, internet gaming disorder can either be viewed as a specific type of video game addiction or as a variant of internet addiction or as an independent diagnosis. And this is the basic problem. Uh, when they when they they sell video games, when they sell you a video game for your PS, your PlayStation, PS4, or what's the other one? I can't. Well, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm not really that knowledgeable in the systems because I don't play video games. But uh, this and this is a problem because what they're talking about, they're saying, oh yeah, the internet video games are bad. But uh, the the video games that I sell these kids, this is fine, no problem at all. Now, how in the world do the internet uh, video and uh, uh, in, in internet video games? How do they make their money? Well, the way they make their money is they make you buy things uh, in in order to stay in the game. That's the idea. And so, and this is the problem because we're not dealing with apples and oranges here. We're dealing with two different types of apples. We're dealing with Macintosh and, and Red Delicious. Uh, you get my meaning. These these aren't, you know, a video game. Whether you play it on on the internet or whether you have a, a console, it's still a video game. And people are spending hours a day uh, on these video games and this is the problem yet the, the they're being semantic they're being pedantic by saying oh no these two aren't the same at all you can't you can't compare this video game with this video game that that doesn't work because this is in a console and that's on the internet and now of course they've got uh, uh, video games 
uh, consoles that uh, you have to connect to the internet in order to play with other people. So it's just like playing in, uh, on the internet, video games on the internet. The nine proposed criteria for uh, internet uh, gaming uh, disorder, uh, of which five or more need to be endorsed and resulting in clinical significant impairment. Now, these th these are the nine criteria that they're looking at, okay? Um, so you, you need to think about people that you know, maybe a, a, a cousin or, or maybe a brother or sister. Think of, of how, how much they play. So this is... These are the uh, nine criteria. Uh, preoccupation with internet games, that's salience. Uh, withdrawal symptoms when internet gaming is taken away, that's withdrawal. Uh, the need to spend increasing amounts of time engaged in internet gaming, that's tolerance. Unsuccessful attempts to control participation in internet gaming, relapse, uh, loss of control. Loss of interest in hobbies and entertainment as a result of and with the exception of internet gaming. That's conflict between hobbies and the gaming. Continued excessive use of internet games, despite knowledge of psychosocial problems. That's conflict again. Deception of family members, therapists, or others regarding the amount of internet gaming. That's conflict. Uh, use of the internet game to escape or relieve a negative mood. Mood modification. And loss of a significant relationship, job, or educational or career opportunity because of the participation in internet games. And that is another example of conflict. Let me tell you a quick story. My daughter, my daughter got married uh, back in 2000. Uh, in 2000, she married a, uh, a, a kid. She's got this strange fascination for people who are wealthy. It would be like uh, marrying Donald Trump, except he didn't have, they, his family had actually lost all their money, but they still acted like they were wealthy. And that's not really the important thing. The important thing was that uh, the, the kids were raised uh, relatively spoiled because they were raised as if they were wealthy. They lived in a wealthy neighborhood. Uh, their mother kept marrying uh, fairly wealthy individuals. I think they'd have three or four stepfathers. Not that that's important. The important thing is the way that they were raised. These two guys, these two kids, um, they had, they always had the latest game, and, and the thing about the game that uh, I didn't quite understand was that uh, they would uh, read magazines that would tell them how to cheat. And I always thought, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would you want to do that? I mean, it's, it's the competition you're after. No, that's not what they were after. They, they were narcissistic. They wanted to win. They wanted to dominate, uh, which was kind of curious. Anyway, so my daughter marries this guy, this kid. Uh, he tried to break away from this uh, pathological toxic direction that his life was taking by joining the military and he he uh, uh, of course he figured that they would ask him to become an officer and he'd have this really important job uh, as it turned out uh, he had been such a, a deadhead um, in in his schooling uh, that when he of course in the military you have to take the ASVAB uh, and they they put you someplace, and they put they made him a mechanic, uh, so he fixed airplanes. He didn't fix airplanes. He didn't fix the engines. What he did, uh, he's the one that uh, fixed the. Uh, if they got a bullet hole, then he would take out a section of, of the wing, and he would he would put in a he would uh, put in a uh, rivet in a uh, a patch. That that was his job. He he riveted patches. Okay, and of course, this was not during a war, so that's not like everybody's getting shot. So, uh, strangely enough, uh, because his job was really it was kind of a something that you would only need in a in a war zone, uh, he didn't have a whole lot of work to do. Uh, but you know, he'd been playing video games all of his life. He always had he always had his PlayStation or whatever it was. Anyway, so eventually. Uh, so we got into to other games like uh, volleyball. He was he was kind of tall, uh, so he and my daughter's a volleyball coach, and she's a really good volleyball player. So they played on the base team together, um, and eventually they you know fell in love and they got married. <clears throat> and uh, so 
he uh, got out of the service, decided to get out of the service, and uh, he decided that he would go to school and study robotics because, you know, he could build things. He, he actually could patch things. Uh, but he decided he wanted to go into robotics, which is, you know, that's kind of cool. So my daughter's working her tail off, you know, trying to keep the two of them together because, or trying to keep uh, the household together. Uh, and he's going to school, and so what would uh, what would happen is uh, they would uh, leave at the same time. We gave him a car. We gave him one of our old cars when we bought a new car, and so here he had his own car. She had her car, of course, and uh, he would go to school and she'd go to work, and she'd work her tail off and come home at five o'clock, and there. And by that time, he was home, of course. But he never seemed to do homework. That was the weird part. Well, what had happened is uh, that he had uh, applied to go to, to, to take all these classes, all these fabulous classes, because he kept saying how smart he was. Uh, and what he would do, he would double back, and he would come home, and he'd play video games all day instead of going to school. And eventually, of course, he flunked out of school. Uh, they gave him two semesters. He's pulling the, these stunts uh, for, for a whole year. Uh, one morning she had to come back. Um, and, you know, it's this is the, the age-old story. Uh, she comes back early uh, because she forgot something, and, and he's already home playing video games. Well, the usual story is he's having an affair with somebody. But, of course, he wasn't having an affair with anybody. He was just lying to her about going to school. Uh, and he was playing video games with his brother. Uh, his brother lived in Cleveland at the time. And he was also supposed to be going to college, but he didn't, wasn't going to college. Either the two of them were playing these video games. They were teaming up and, and beating people, you know, anyway. So my daughter got pissed off and said, look, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to be married to a deadbeat. Uh, you either get a job or, or I'll leave you. And, of course, he pretended to get a job, and he pretended that he was doing this. And, of course, he was playing video games the whole time. Uh, and that's it. I, so eventually, she divorced him, and, and she's hated men ever since. <laughs> as bizarre as that may seem. Anyway, that's my story. Did, does he have uh, internet gaming uh, disorder? Um, yeah, it, uh, it ruined his marriage. Uh, so he he would probably fit a bunch of these criteria. I'm not going to look into it. I, you know, I'm 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 really I was really upset with him because you know he acted like this rich kid and uh, the spoiled little rich kid. He, you know, the whole Donald Trump thing just ugh. as soon as Donald Trump became uh, started running for president, I, it just turned my teeth on edge because I've been around those kids too much. Wealthy people who think that they can do anything and that there are no consequences because usually their money pays, keeps the, the consequences from affecting them. Clinical interventions and treatment for problematic and or addictive gaming vary considerably in the literature, with most of the very few published studies employing some type of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy, and or self-devised psychological interventions. Hahn et al. presented uh, some successful case studies regarding pharmacotherapeutic treatment, and actually, I, I had this study uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the lecture. After a six weeks uh, and twelve week period of bu bu bupropion uh, uh, sustained release treatment, uh, problematic gamers showed significant improvement both in decreased problem behavior and decreased depression scores, and that's. Well, exactly what the, the study says. The researchers' pharmacological choice had been driven by the similarities in neurological activity of different behavioral addictions, and we're going to talk about that. They did functional MRIs, uh, and they selected the pharma, uh, the uh, the pharmaceutical uh, by the patterns uh, uh, in their brains that were so similar to other addictive uh, uh, other addictive um, substances. Currently, the evidence base uh, on the treatment of problematic and or addictive gaming is limited. Furthermore, the lack of uh, consistent approaches to treating problematic video game playing and video game addiction 
makes it difficult to produce any definitive conclusions as to the efficacy of treatment, although at this stage, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, as with the treatment efficacy of other addictions, appears to show good pr uh, preliminary support. And you know how CBT works. You tell people what is wrong with their thinking, and then they change their thinking pattern. Woog uh, surveyed a random sample of 5,000 U.S. mental health professionals. 229 participants uh, completed the, serve, uh, the questionnaire. Two-thirds had treated someone with uh, excessive computer use problems in the year prior to the survey. So this is not an uncommon problem, as the gaming industry would like you, th like you to think. Woog also reported that uh, problematic gaming was most common among 11 to 17-year-old clients. Uh, this client group may be more likely to uh, present in therapy as, an, as anecdotal uh, evidence suggests that they are typically forced by concerned parents to attend treatment. Uh, adult gaming addicts may not seek treatment or seek treatment at a later stage for other psychological problems, for example, depression, that develop after experiencing the severe negative consequences of gaming. In Southeast Asia, where uh, there appears to be significant demand for treatment for online-related problems, including gaming addiction, the South Korean government has reported established uh, has reportedly established a network of over 140 counseling centers for the treatment of online addiction. In Western countries, gaming addiction clinics have also started to emerge in places such as Holland and the UK. And we already know that Germany's got a problem with addiction, and so does Hungary. There are also treatment groups that are modeled on 12-step uh, self-help treatment, uh, for example, Online Gamers Anonymous. Block suggested that the diagnosis for online problems, including excessive gaming, should be included in the DSM-5 as a compulsive-impulsive uh, spectrum disorder. Publication of clinical criteria in future DSM would facilitate and enhance standardization of research and treatment in the gaming studies field. Uh, it may also help minimize the potential for inappropriate clustering of clinical behaviors within an overly broad classification of problematic online behavior. Now, if you think about it, uh, if you think about it, and, and of course the gaming industry is telling us, oh, come on, it's only 9%. Oh, come on, it's only 3.4%. But if you think of anxiety and you think of depression um, and uh you know, all the personality disorders, you know, all, none of these are, most of these are right around 9 or 10%. So gaming is just as serious as alcoholism. It's just as serious, a uh, gaming addiction is just as serious as alcoholism or, or heroin addiction. Uh, and, and it's affecting people's lives. And that's one of the reasons why, why something needs to be done. Right now, of course, the gaming industry is blinding research to the uh, the fact that um, that this needs to they need to do something. And of course, one of the things that they will need to do is change the way their games are structured. The games are structured so that people become addicted to them, so that people will play them over and over and over again, so that they will wear out their consoles and have to buy a new one. Or as soon as the new console comes out, with better graphics, of course, they will have to buy it. That's the way it works. Somebody's making money, and they don't care about the consequences. Just like, just like uh, you know, vodka and whiskey. Those guys, you know, the people that manufacture them. You know, there's people dying every day of you know in automobile accidents and whatnot. They just keep making their product. And these guys are going to continue making their product and trying to convince people that it's not a problem. So what are we talking about? It may also minimize the potential of inappropriate clustering of clinical behaviors within an overly broad classification of problematic online behavior. And one of the other things that's happening, and, and I looked at just a ton of di different textbooks, and most of the textbooks are about developing video games. Um, 
uh, a gamer ga gamer brain is you know I I had have a book called Gamer Brain. I think I I included that in the list of books. Uh, it's all about uh, how you get people to keep playing your game, how you get them to be uh, uh, addictive. Um, as weird as that sounds. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. Oh, only 3.4%. That's not so bad. Maybe it is. There are also strong links between online gaming, gambling, non-gambling uh, fantasy games, role-playing games, board games, and card games. Yeah, let's 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 blame Euchre for, for this problem or or gin rummy or something. These may be an ad additional cause for concern as youth migrate from free gaming sites to online gambling sites. Video game playing does not occur in a vacuum, but is a single behavior engaged in alongside many others. Research needs to examine links between video games and other risk, uh, risk behaviors, for example, gambling, drug and alcohol use, seatbelt use, poor school performance, conduct, pro conduct problems, truancy, delinquency, violence, and sexual activity. Yeah, let's blame something else besides the video games. In, okay, so the, this is a, this guy's not really dead. He's just resting. Uh, I found this picture, and I th <laughs> but I'm going to talk about people that have died at uh, playing video games. Deadly competitive. In January of 2015, two men died in an internet cafe in Taiwan. The first 38-year-old uh, man died after playing for five days straight from fatigue and physical exhaustion. He's not really dead. I, I don't want you to think he is. The second man, a 32 year old of, uh, who is 32 years old, he died after playing for three days straight from cardiac arrest and exhaustion. And this is in Taiwan in 2015. In one month, it wasn't the same. Uh, it wasn't the same uh, uh, internet cafe. It was they were different cafes, uh, and and they were. <laughs> I, I read about both of these individuals, and uh, they they seemed to think it was really important where th where they were uh, playing their games. Which which internet cafe? Uh, one of the most infamous video game death uh, death cases was the death of a 23 year old who died clutching a keyboard and mouse while staring ahead due to rigor mortis at an internet cafe in New Taipei City's Sanchong District in February of 2012. Okay, so this is a 23-year-old. They didn't realize he was dead. He was sitting there clutching his mouse and, and with his hand on the keyboard, and he was dead, and he had been dead long enough for rigor mortis to set in. Well, how long does it take rigor mortis to set in? It starts to set in at two hours, and it is complete at 12 hours. So nobody realized he was gone. Budding computer programmer Chris Staniforth, who was only 20 years old, died from playing too much Halo. His 12-hour marathon Xbox sessions caused a fatal pulmonary embolism, a type of blood clot that can occur when someone sits in the same position for several hours. Chris had just been accepted to Leicester University to study game design when he collapsed outside a uh, university... <laughs> universe. United Kingdom Job Center, after complaining of a low heart rate, he had no previous medical conditions, but he threw a blood clot, that's what an embolism is, uh, from his lung, and it killed him. 23, 20 years old, I'm sorry, he's 20 years old. Now, what's so what's the problem with sitting in the same seat for an extended length of time? Uh, for one thing, you're, you're cutting off your circulation to the back of your thighs, and this can cause blood clots. Uh, a real d dangerous problem, uh, something that everybody needs to think about. It's why you need to get up and walk around sometimes. An unidentified 30-year-old man in Beijing died after spending three days immersed in an online game at a local internet cafe. He lost consciousness and was rushed to the hospital, but could not be revived. According to the reports, the man had spent more than uh, 10,000 won, approximately $1,500, on gaming in the months before his death. A 28-year-old man from South Korea died while playing StarCraft, and that needs to be a capital C, I'm sorry, uh, for 50 hours with only, uh, with only few short breaks. 
The cause of death was presumed to be heart failure stemming from exhaustion. Uh, the man who had eaten very little during his marathon gaming session only stopped playing to go to the toilet a few times and for brief periods of sleep. He had recently been fired from his job because he kept missing work to play computer games. 28-year-old man. Gerald Spannenberg, an avid World of Warcraft player, died while raiding with his World of Warcraft guild after getting into a heated argument during the raid. His cause of death was an abdom abdominal aneurysm, presumably brought about by long periods of sitting at the computer combined with the stress of, argument, of the argument. After Gerald suddenly uh, went silent during the raid, he was auto-logged out of the game after 10 minutes of inactivity and did not log in again. His guides assumed he was being child, his guildies, I'm sorry, his guildies uh, decided, assumed he was being childish and had deserted them. So they kicked him out of the guild and kept on raiding. It wasn't until three weeks later that they learned what happened when Ger from Gerald's daughter and felt horrible about it because they kicked him out of the guild for being a big baby. A young Chinese girl, known by her nickname Snowly, died after playing World of Warcraft for several days straight during a national holiday. Snowly was a key member of her World of Warcraft guild, who said the girl had been preparing for a very difficult raid and had had very little rest in the days prior. An in-game funeral was held for Snowly in the week after her death, but sadly the event was overshadowed by the death of another popular World of Warcraft uh, player during the same week. So how much time on the computer is appropriate for a child? This, you need to set limits. You need to set limits. This is a par parental thing. How much uh, is too much uh, time? Uh, how, much how much time is appropriate? How much gaming is too much? What games are okay for children to play? When should they play on the computer? Is there, uh, is there room in their schedule for homework, sports, exercise, time with family and friends? And this is one of the positive things. I talked about my grandson uh, playing uh, uh, Fortnite. Um, there for a while, he was playing Fortnite. He would come home from school, and he'd play Fortnite until his mom made him get off. When she came home, she she's a teacher. When she came home from school, she would make him get off the, the computer. And of course, we were both thinking, you know, this isn't good. He's not. He's focusing more on Fortnite than he is on anything else. Uh, but what has happened since then? He started playing on several soccer teams. Uh, he played football in the fall. He's uh, he's on a basketball team right now. He's practicing or playing a game practically every night. And uh, actually, I think both of us, his, my daughter and uh, and I, both think uh, this is a really good thing because he seems to be more focused on uh, on sports than he is on anything else. And and you know that's always a healthy thing. Uh, getting exercise. He played a game last night, played really, really well. Uh, it's an indoor, played indoors. Anyway, so th that's my grandson. Uh, we're, we're both really happy that uh, uh, that he's not playing nearly as much Fortnite, if he's playing any at all. Uh, ta he still talks about Pokemon cards, but he doesn't do anything with them. Uh, so, you know, he's, uh, I'll tell you, <laughs> He's got games practically every night. When he uh, he was playing so playing soccer and he was uh, practicing football or playing football all fall. So we're really happy that he, he has uh, adjusted from uh, who he was um, in the summertime. When he, then the pr part of the problem is his his dad lives in Florida, and of course he's right here in in Iowa. Uh, and in the summertime he has to. He has to go down and live with his dad for six weeks, and his dad uses the uh, computer and computer games as a babysitter. And that is something that uh, uh, my daughter and I are not real happy with, but there's not a lot we can do about it because, because they have joint custody. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and get move, keep moving here. Uh, follow your own rules. Uh, no screen time for children under two years of age. Uh, 
Bad picture, bad picture. One to two hours daily screen time for preschool aged children. Two hours for elementary aged children. Two to three hours of daily screen time for middle and high school aged uh, teens. This is screen time, uh, meaning uh, both television and computer entertainment. Uh, that includes TikTok. Uh, my grandson uh, does watch a lot of TikTok. Um, I've seen some TikTok, and I'm wondering, uh, is he seeing the same thing I am? Because uh, some of those are uh, fairly risque. It uh, doesn't bother me, of course. Uh, but then again, I'm 73 years old, and he's 10. So when, when he sees some young lady uh, dancing and bouncing around, is he looking at the same thing that I am? Of course, being a adult male, I'm, I'm looking at, at select things. I'm just wondering if he's looking at the same thing that I am. Uh, no television, internet, or gaming console in your child's room. Uh, make a plan scheduling gaming time and choices in advance. Uh, a gaming plan helps everyone choose and use gaming carefully. Uh, address fairness issues with the uh, siblings. Older siblings may have different limits from younger siblings. And the ter the and as we're going to see in, in a uh, uh, research, it, it seems to be ten. Ten seems to be when they start moving into adolescence. Limit children's total screen time, including time playing video and computer games and surfing the internet. Adding television viewing to screen time is optional uh, as far as you are concerned. One of the problems is, and this is a problem that, uh, or this is something that I had seen. Um, of course, in my time, uh, there was no, there were no computers, there was no internet, uh, so we watched television. Now, to somebody my age or somebody my daughter's age, who grew up with television, television doesn't seem that bad. Of course, there is some crappy television out there. All these strange things. Survivor. She watches Survivor and she watches cooking shows. Ugh, drives me nuts. Anyway, um, the idea may be from my generation and from my daughter's generation that television is is benign. It's not so bad. Uh, what's bad is the Internet. You never know what they're going to see on the Internet. You, If you turn on a cooking show, you know you're going to see a cooking show and not uh, a lady bouncing around with her breasts bouncing around or whatever. Well, not usually anyway. <clears throat> Of course, you never know what you're going to see on Survivor. There for a while, the women were wearing some fairly skimpy bathing suits. But then again, I've only seen it a couple times. Uh, maybe they've decided that that was not what they should show. Parents should uh, help their teens and children choose video games that are appropriate for their ages and interests. Parents should check content ratings and parental advisories for all media. Explain any objections to media choices. Explain why and help them make appropriate choices. Be aware that of what games your child is playing and what games are their favorites. Uh, parents should sit in on sessions to better understand the nature of the gaming experience and witness their behavior. Be aware of the language and gaming slang being used. Ask for definitions. WTF means the same to them as it does to you. Okay, and that's, you know, saying WTF is better than, than saying it out, than saying it, uh, what it stands for. But the reality is that when you see WTF, you're saying what it actually means, and they're actually doing the same thing. And, of course, this is people trying to clean things up. Um, a good example would be... Uh, when I, when I was growing up, instead of saying Jesus, uh, we would say, geez, man, come on, geez, geez. And, and the, the reality is, of course, you know, you're, you're shortening it and not saying, actually saying it, but it's actually the same thing. So, uh, and, and this is one of the things, you know, you need to remember, uh, LM, uh, LMAO uh, still means laugh my ass off. So, you know, and the kids know this. And so that's one of the things you need to 
be aware of. And of course, I don't know any of the the gaming slang. I'm sure there's there's things that would uh, not shock me. Of course, I've heard just about everything. But uh, anyway, you need to be aware of, of all this stuff and whether they're being uh, uh, inundated with it. Develop a list of enjoyable. Uh, one of the things my my uh, uh, grandson does is he says, what the? And then he doesn't finish it. Well, we know what he could what he could be finishing it with. He picked it up down in Florida, so we're not exactly sure what what to what we should do. Uh, my my wife has told him she didn't doesn't want to hear that from him. And so he's not doing it in front of my wife, of course. But that doesn't mean he's not doing it at school. That doesn't mean he's not doing it at home. Uh, his, his mother may be ignoring it, but uh, my wife didn't. Okay, anyway. Develop a list of enjoyable activities that can fill the void of screen time. The most common reason children cite for playing video games is boredom. A parent who expects the limited time to be filled with chores and homework is probably mistaken. And of course, if you if they're if you're forcing them to do that, they may feel cheated. This may mean that the parent will have have to join in the new fun activities, whatever that may happen to be. Uh, when my grandson comes over to visit, we play a lot of board games. Um, one game that we were playing last time is a game called Kaboom, and he was just murdering me in that game. Uh, and we played it over and over and over again, and I got my my butt kicked over and over and over again because I'm not very good at bombarding his, uh, his structures, and he's really good at bomb bombarding mine. If the gaming limits uh, creates... Uh, conflict the parents should not negotiate as that will create a situation where the limits are perpetually expanded until the limits are meaningless. Uh, if talk is un uh, unsuccessful, the professional may uh, seek uh, needed professional help. Uh, professional help may be required if the child has any of the following problems and is using gaming as a means of focusing. ADHD, learning disabilities, uh, mood disorders, addiction issues, and anger management. And obviously, this little girl has an anger issue. She's pretty young, but at the same time, look at that face. Uh, okay, so this is one of the uh, one of the articles uh, that we're going to talk about. Hartman, Jung, and Vorderer: What determines video game use? The impact of users' habits, addictive tendencies, and intentions to play. And this is from the Journal of uh, Media Psychology. Uh, the Hartman et al. Uh, 2012 uh, study explored the role of intentions, habits, and addictive tendencies in people's video game use. Survey data was collected in two waves uh, out of 351 uh, subjects, measuring uh, causal factors and outcomes. Results of mediation analyses reveal a positive impact of both habits and addictive tendencies on video game use that is partly affected by users' intentions. Moderation analyses suggest that the impact of habits, but not of addictive tendencies, on video game use decreases the less users intend to play. And I guess that makes that makes sense. If you're intending to go out to dinner, uh, then you're not suddenly going to uh, uh, play the game because because your intention was to go to dinner rather than to uh, play. Or if you think, well, I've got uh, I got 20 minutes before I have to be someplace, I'll go ahead and play this game for 20 minutes, and then you lose track of time and and you don't go. Well, that does that's not what happened. If somebody intended to play, they intended to play or not to play, and they didn't do it. Taken together, these findings suggest that users' video game habits, addictive tendencies, and the intentions jointly determine video game use. This is uh, research by Rabin and Bear, uh, 2013, Family, Media, and School-Related Risk Factors of Video Game Addiction, a five-year longitudinal study. And this is one of the longitudinal studies uh, that uh, kind of slapped the gaming industry in the face. 
Uh, this study investigated the causes of gaming addiction in an attempt to explain why video game playing as a widespread phenomenon leads to a comparatively small percentage of addicted players. Now, these guys are in Germany, and so their numbers were, what, 4.6 and 3.4? In this paper, it, wait a minute, it's 3.6 and 0 0.3 for females, 3.6 for males. In this paper, the results of a two-wave longitudinal study comprising a sample of students from grades 4 to 9 are presented looking at family media and school-related risk factors. And those are the two researchers. This is Bear and this is Rabin. In fourth grade, 34% of children had their own TV, 29% had their own computer, 23% had a gaming console, and 59% had a handheld gaming console. Now, this has become a fairly controversial. My, my grandson is in the fifth grade, and uh, his dad has been promising him a gaming console for the last two or three years. Uh, his dad's a bit of a deadbeat, but that's kind of the guy that my daughter's attracted to. People that have been wealthy and are deadbeats now. Anyway, not important. Anyway, that's 59% uh, had handheld uh, gaming consoles. You have to remember this is in 2013. Uh, handheld gaming consoles, not so popular now. Uh, back then, they were really popular. Video games were used for 56 minutes per day. Uh, boys used uh, them for 76 minutes, average 76 minutes, and girls 38 minutes. 33% uh, of the children had already used uh, games which were only suitable for players above the age of 16 or 18. That's one-third of them had played games they weren't supposed to have played. In, the, in ninth grade, adolescents used video games 137 minutes per day. For boys, it was an average of 207 minutes a day, and for girls, it was, it was 79 minutes a day. Now, 207 minutes is, what, almost three hours? Uh, isn't it? Wait a minute. 60, that's three. That's over three hours. It's about three and a half hours. Uh, yeah, 60 minutes per hour. Okay. And for girls, it was an hour and 15 minutes or so. 10 adolescents, 2.6% were classified as being at risk. And five adolescents, 1.3%, were identified as being addicted to video games. Now, remember, this is lower than the statistics we saw for Germany, but, uh, you know, they, they just took a group, and that's what they found. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the other statistics aren't correct. That just means they happened to get a, a group of children that, uh, uh, that didn't have the same number of, uh, same percentage of uh, children with addict, uh, addiction problems. The relevance of school-related variables is emphasized by the fact that well-being at school pro uh, proves to be a protective factor. Social involvement and emotional experience in school could prove to be important predictors of gaming addiction. Children with a difficult position in real life may well be entering virtual worlds in an inadequate attempt at self-regulation. A lack of social involvement and limited well-being at school are compensated for in a dysfunctional manner by the recognition and self-efficacy experienced in video games, though the risk of long-term psychological addiction increases. Uh, so uh, the better they do at school, uh, the less likely they are to become addicted. And uh, it also, one of the things this slide also says is that they may be compensating for a problem they're having in real life. And that's why they play video games so much. Parental devotion and supervision did not prove to be significant for the estimation of risk. And, of course, in, a, in another uh, study, we saw that that's what they were saying. That was last week. This was shown for media-related parent supervision. Uh, the result of the study provided no basis for arguing that this is a promising st strategy for the age group of 10 years and older. Now, this is really kind of important because we just talked about in another textbook. Actually, that was in Video Games and Your Kids. Um, that's where I got that, that information. They're really not talking about the 10-year-olds and older. What they're talking about is limiting your the uh, children that are younger than that. 
Uh, if you haven't got them by the time, if you haven't limited their uh, video game usage by the time they're 10 years old, these guys are saying these, you know, in Germany, it's too late. They're, they're already gone. Two conclusions can be drawn from this. Approaches aimed at parental responsibility and media-related risk reduction would appear to be useful only if they begin significantly earlier than the 10th year of life. And that's, uh, they, they suggested, at the preschool age. With recourse uh, to pre previous research, research results in the data from the study, it can be concluded that prevention concepts are inextricably tied to the characteristic psychological vulnerabilities of children who are at risk and thus should be geared toward enhancing psychological health. So what's the problem that we're seeing? Well, the problem that we're seeing is the individuals that are having, uh, that are really in serious problems are the ones that are already having real life problems. Now, if those real life problems are divorce, uh, family uh, uh, upheaval, uh, something negative happening in the family, they may be turning to video games uh, to combat that. Uh, if you've ever seen the, uh, the television show Stranger Things, that's what was going on with the redhead in that, uh, in that show. Um, and with, well, the other kid wasn't playing video games. But the redhead was, and she became a really good, uh, really good video game player. Uh, yeah, and she beat somebody's time or something. Anyway, that was, that's why she was doing it. She was uh, playing video games to compensate for a uh, problem with, uh, it, with her home life. Our data suggests that distinctive features and prevention concepts are not sensitive to the development of gaming addiction. Banning media devices from children's rooms or to adhere to specific gaming times thus appear not to be very promising, at least for children aged 10 years and over. So they're saying that if you haven't done it by the time they're 10, then it, it ain't, it's not going to do you any good. That's actually what they are saying. So you might as well, well, I don't know. I don't know what, what's going to come next. Uh, the factors and problems underlying gaming addiction are obviously of a fundamental nature. They primarily affect the personality and the motives underlying the gaming behavior. With respect to the type of games used, violent content could turn out to be less crucial than specific characteristics of the game that are important to keeping the user playing for extended periods of time. And of course, they're not. They're saying that it's it's not the type of game, it's not why they're it's why they're playing it, not the type of game they're playing. Although gaming uh, time predicts uh, gaming addiction in in a model that only includes media usage variables, in the full longitudinal model the effect disappears. This supports the assumption that gaming time is a weak predictor for gaming addiction. In our cross-sectional model, problematic video game use was predicted by elevated gaming time. High gaming time in childhood could lead to problematic video game use, which in turn heightens the risk for the development of gaming addiction. These children are endangered not because of their elevated gaming time, but because of the negative consequences they are willing to accept to sustain their gaming behavior. In other words, it's, it's how, this is how they're compensating for something else. And what they're willing to sacrifice, their social life, uh, their friends, their family, if they're willing to sacrifice these things to in increase their gaming time, uh, then that is the problem, not, not, the, uh, not the gaming behavior. With respect to school-related performance indicators, our study shows that gaming addiction cannot be predicted uh, by uh, means of either school grades or one's self-concept of ability uh, to perform at school. However, school-related deficiencies in performance could be the consequence rather than the cause of gaming addiction. Children who do not participate much in their classmates' uh, social activities and who do not feel comfortable at school have an elevated risk at the development of gaming addiction as well as uh, of subsequent academic failure. So these guys are saying exactly the same thing. There's a, it, there's a lot of, of factors that we're dealing with, and you can't just take one factor out and say this is the cause, uh, you know, the type of game or whatever.
The data show that 15-year-old... Wait a minute, we just saw this kid. Oh, different picture. Okay. The data show that 15-year-old video game addicts had already exhibited a number of specific risk factors at the age of 10. And this is one of the reasons why they were saying, hey, look, um, if you haven't, if you haven't uh, taken care of the situation by the age of 10, then you know this is not going to fix anything. Students from single-parent families seem to be particularly at risk, as are students with low experience school well-being and with a weaker social integration in class. And of course, this is one of the thing, the other things that we're seeing. Um, you know, if, if people are being bullied at school. Uh, then, then they play excessive video games. Now, is it the video game that's causing the problem or the bullying at school? It's the two of them are going together. Now they're going to become shooters and they're going to shoot the school up, uh, especially the people that were bullying them. Uh, just this weekend, uh, an individual that had been playing football decided that, uh, that, uh, the, that he needed uh, to uh, he needed revenge on some of the people on the football team, and he shot and killed three of them. He shot five other people. We're not exactly sure sure who they are, but the, the three people that he killed were all football players. The data also indicate that problematic use of video games in childhood increases the risk of gaming addiction in adolescents. Male students are especially vulnerable for developing gaming addiction. So we got lots and lots of problems here. Uh, these are lots of, there are lots of, of factors. One of them, of course, being the fact that they are male. Okay, this is the, the study that they were talking about, bupropion. Um, this is the study from 2010 uh, that, that was, that was uh, talked about earlier. Uh, Bupropion has been used in the treatment of patients with substance dependence. Hahn et al. in 2010 hypothesized that six weeks of bupropion uh, treatment would decrease craving for internet gameplay as well as video game cue induced brain activity in patients with internet video game addiction. 19 male subjects, 11 diagnosed with internet video game addiction, and eight controls were used in the study. The addicted subjects played StarCraft for an average of 30 hours a week, and the controls knew how to play the game, and, but they only played for three hours per week. And they were the control. You had to have played StarCraft prior. The, the, and this was done in Korea, by the way. Um, anyway, uh, there were the, the 11 addicted individuals played StarCraft for an average of 30 hours a week, and the other, the controls played... Uh, for three hours per week. A baseline uh, functional MRI was taken of all the subjects using the Q StarCraft. Uh, between the two groups, there were significant differences in terms of craving for, for playing StarCraft. The addicted group were then asked to take a maintenance dose of bupropion for six weeks while their StarCraft gameplay was being monitored. Now, the, the way that they did this, uh, the way that they cued StarCraft was by showing them videos of a StarCraft game, of people playing a StarCraft game. Now, they didn't ne really need to show them very much. They showed it, showed it in 60-second increments. One increment was 90 uh, seconds, uh, and, and they did this six times before they, uh, before they did the functional MRI. Okay. <clears throat> After six weeks of and one of the and they they took the baseline functional MRI, the baseline and as you can imagine the the individuals that were addicted when they saw the uh, the segments of uh, people playing StarCraft it excited them they it, it activated their brain uh, for the uh, the control uh, not so much didn't didn't do that much uh, for them. After six weeks of bupropion uh, treatment in the addicted group, maladaptive behaviors became, because of excessive playing internet video games were improved. Six individuals in the addicted group showed improved daily routines to the degree family members found to be acceptable. Four addicted individuals were no longer absent from school during the uh, treatment period. After six weeks of uh, bupropion uh, treatment in the addicted group, 
there were significant decreases in the terms of craving for playing StarCraft. Uh, the uh, amount de of, of decrease was 23.6%, and the total playing game time uh, was reduced by 35.4%. And that is the end of that. Um, uh, this is the first time I've ever taught this class. It uh, didn't quite come together the way I thought it was going to come together. Uh, I, I tried to keep things going. If you have any uh, uh, suggestions or complaints, um, you know, I can change things around a little bit. Uh, but uh, this is the first time I've ever taught it. Uh, I thought that it worked out fairly well. The problem may be in the future. I don't know that I can find a, a textbook that covers uh, that covers uh, uh, internet, the uh, social media, and uh, and and internet gaming. I don't know if I can find that textbook. I may have to, you know, find three. I, I guess. But if you have any suggestions or anything, um, then. Uh, uh, just drop me an email, say, hey, you know, uh, I wish you hadn't talked this much about this stuff, or I wish you had talked about something else. Uh, this is the last lecture, so uh, I guess I'm finished with the class. Um, I, like I said, I can change anything that needs to be changed. Uh, I tried to give you all the information that I thought you needed. I thought we needed to say something negative about, about gaming. Gaming addiction is out there, obviously it is. The, the, in China, they have over a, a, a million people that they are diagnosing as uh, as addicted. It's a real serious problem. In, well, I, I told you about this earlier. It's a real serious problem in Southeast Asia, in China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan. Um, and obviously, it's a problem. I mean, 3.6% 3. 3. or 3.4%, whatever it was, in Germany, 9% in the United States. You know, this isn't something to sneeze at. Uh, and people are dying in Taiwan anyway. Uh, <laughs> and Beijing. Uh, but uh, hopefully nobody in the United States is is dying, except that, that one kid. I mean, he developed, uh, he developed, he lost his, his ability to walk because he wouldn't do anything but play video games. That seems pretty serious to me. Anyway, okay, so uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for taking the class. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed uh, putting it together. So uh, I'll talk to you later. Good luck getting everything finished.